really admire Dr. Condoleezza Rice. And when I was Miss America, I had the opportunity to visit her at the White House and spend about 30 minutes. And that was one of the most incredible privileges during that year because she's gracious, she's warm, she's sophisticated and brilliant. And if I could be someone, I want to be Dr. Condi Rice. I had been accepted to Harvard Law School and saw how much it was going to cost to pay for it, realized that I didn't have anywhere remotely near that amount of money, and had a great college advisor who said, if you really want to go, find a creative way of paying for it. And so I told my parents, my creative way of paying for it is I'm going to attempt to become Miss America this year. I was crowned Miss America and then went to Harvard Law School and then graduated debt free. I've always had a strong interest in the political process. I didn't know exactly how that would manifest itself later in life. Well, after graduating law school, I began practicing law. I represent religious and not-for-profit groups on some of the First Amendment religious freedom issues that they face. And that gives me the opportunity to defend people's religious liberties and to ensure that their rights are upheld. When we look at what's wrong with our country right now, part of it is career politicians. And so often what's wrong with our system is that people wait their turn. And I think leadership is not waiting your turn and waiting till someone says, now is your time to step up. It's when you feel a sense of urgency and you feel that you have a unique voice and a perspective that can change our country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Erica Harold, Miss America 2003 and 10 under 40 honoree. I'm extremely honored to have been included as one of the 10 under 40, and I'd like to thank the American Conservative Union for this distinction. Each of us has our own unique story of how we came to be a conservative and how we became passionate conservative activists, and I'm honored to be able to have the opportunity to share mine with you this evening. I didn't grow up in a political home. I actually became a conservative when I was a college student at the University of Illinois. Now, I recognize that college is not the place where most people become conservatives, but I was studying political science and American history, and I had the opportunity to study our nation's foundational documents for our, myself, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers. And I began to compare our country and our freedoms with countries where the government has more centralized power. And it quickly became apparent to me that those countries where government is centralized power, they are less prosperous, and the people's civil liberties are not protected. And in countries like ours where we have limited government, the country is more prosperous economically and people's civil liberties are respected. And I began to marvel at the genius of our Constitution. I wasn't seeking to find a political philosophy, but all of a sudden I realized I had one. I was a conservative, a constitutional conservative. I also realized how important it was to ensure that those constitutional principles of limited government and respecting civil liberties are reflected in our government. One key example of this is in the arena of protecting religious freedom. Part of my legal practice as an attorney involves representing religious institutions and defending their First Amendment rights. I have seen all too often how some would try to silence religious groups from speaking in the public square and saying your participation has to be confined to the four walls of a church. But our First Amendment requires the people of all faiths and no faith at all be freely permitted to speak, and our democracy and society suffers when those voices are silent. I've also seen firsthand the positive role that faith-based groups can have in society. And I've seen this in the work that I've done in prison ministry, I've been involved in prison ministry for the past two years, and I serve on the board of directors of the late Chuck Holson's Prison Fellowship Ministries. And I've seen how transformative it is when people of faith are able to bring a message of hope into our prisons. I remember one experience in particular. I was asked to speak in a women's prison, and I was invited to speak in the segregated housing unit. Women there are incarcerated 23 out of every 24 hours of the day. And the warden was preparing us for what we would encounter. She said, oftentimes, because of the isolating situations and conditions, these inmates are going to be screaming and yelling, and they'll often be screaming expletives, especially at visitors. 
We also were forced to wear flak jackets because they wanted us to be protected in case the inmates decided to try to harm us. I'll be honest, at that point in time, I thought perhaps I don't want to go visit this unit. But when your faith compels you to go, you don't ask what the risk is, you just go. And so I walked into that unit. And so I walked into that unit, I was given the microphone, and I shared the very simple, powerful message of God's love and redemption. And during the entire course of this program, they were silent. And as we finished, the only things that were yelled at us were, God bless you, thank you for coming, and thank you for not forgetting about us. In a society such as ours, we understand that with a limited government, it's not the role of government to impose religion. But by the same token, we know that government must not interfere with the free exercise thereof, and it must not prevent a message of light from being brought into dark places like our country's prisons. This desire to see constitutional principles restored to our government is what motivated me to get involved in politics, whether it's preventing the NSA from encroaching on Fourth Amendment freedoms, or ensuring that the IRS does not target groups based on ideological viewpoints, or ensuring that the executive branch does not usurp Congress's powers, I want to see the limited role of government maintained and our freedoms respected. I also want to see that fundamental ethos of we the people expressed so powerfully in our Constitution's preamble restored to our politics and our government. During my political work, some within the political establishment told me, it's not your turn. And the political establishment sought to drive me from my involvement. But I refuse to step aside because our country is built on the leadership of men and women who decided not to wait their turn and who decided to speak truth to power, even when that power was within their own party. And it must always be this way for each new generation of conservatives and patriots, because what's at stake for our country is too important. What's at stake for our liberty is too important, and what's at stake for our freedom is too important. We cannot wait our turn to try to uphold the Constitution or protect our freedoms. It is always our turn, and it is always our obligation to do so, because we the people must always be that driving force in forming a more perfect unit. May God bless each of you as you stand for freedom and strive to form a more perfect union, and may God always continue to bless our great nation. God bless.